You know, <clears throat> Friday nights, when I was in junior high, Friday nights were the highlight of my week. I love Friday nights because we had a junior high group at the church, and it was such, it was the, it was the most fun thing. I loved going. I'd see all my friends there, and there was such a neat place. Like, it, the adults were caring, but fun. I could be myself. I could be accepted. I, I, I was loved, and we had so much fun. You know, we, we'd learn about the Lord. We'd, we'd, uh, we'd you know, learn about how to, how to uh, interact with the opposite sex, and it was just such a, in a healthy, healthy way, which is important, and it was just such a great time. But there was something even more than the fun and, and the, you know, the adults and the relationships. There was something deeper, and I knew it. We all knew it. There was something in us that was embracing God in a way that maybe we hadn't when we were younger. And there was one thing we did in particular that I really loved, and is often we would go upstairs in the sanctuary. Our church was set up, the church I grew up in, it had like a, the upstairs sanctuary, and then the downstairs had, they called it the lower level. And there was a room down there called the fireside room because it had a fire place. Anyway, deep. But, um, but they had this stairs that would go up in the back, and then the stairs would come out so that um, when the choir was doing their thing, they could go up, and they wouldn't have to walk the whole church to get to their spot in the church. And so we'd have our youth ministry meetings. We'd be on there and we'd do our stuff and we'd run around doing fun stuff. And then we'd settle down and we'd maybe have a Bible study or something. But it was time, then it was time for prayer. <sighs> Woo, see, I got you. <laughs> I woke up somebody. I saw a couple of you guys jump. <laughs> Woo, okay. So there was time for prayer and worship. And we would, you know, the leaders would say, okay, that, you know, we're gonna go upstairs. And we'd go up these stairs and we'd come out. And this beautiful, beautiful sanctuary, and the, this, I don't know how high the, this, the roof was, the ceiling, 40 feet, 30 feet-ish, and at least. And they had the lights turned down dim, just a beautiful place. And then we had this big cross, huge cross in the back, it was backlit. And it had this incredible fabric, this red, uh, like giant red curtain behind it, just beautiful glowing red uh, with, the, with the, I guess it was brass cross. And they had... And someone would go up there and get this all set up. And then they had this, always had this eternal lamp, this eternal candle that would hang down. And when we went up there, we knew that something special was gonna happen because we get up there and there was this, mar we had an altar, there was an altar, church had an altar. It was a Lutheran church and there was a, an altar there. And, um, and then we would just kind of gather all around this area. It was this really sweet marble kind of area. And we would just kind of lay all around, lay around, sit all around and we'd pray and we would worship. And there was just something about going up there. The people had gone up there, had set the atmosphere for us. And we kind of had this expectation that when we went up there, it was like a sacred place. And it was this amazing sense of being close to the presence of God. And the worship was so rich and the prayer was so powerful. And as a young man, I remember that was such a highlight of my life. And I want to talk to you this morning about the presence of of God and about setting the atmosphere. But first, I need to just remind you where we are, what we've been doing. We're in this series called This Is Us, and we're looking at how we can have hope for the future by learning the lessons from 2020, because 2020 was a, a year of learning, right? And we want to launch into this new year. And one of the things we've been talking about, there's been people, maybe you've noticed that some people, man, they are just, they've came out of last year so full of hope, so full of like a, a, a strength, an inner strength. They just seem to have more joy in their life, more peace, because they've learned something. Something was, they went through the exact same experience as everyone else went through, but they were different. And there's another group of people, maybe you, you, you know these people, who came out of last year more fearful, more angry, more bitter, depressed, more anxiety, pessimistic, discouraged, and really not very fun to be around. Maybe you're saying, well, I kind of at times was both of those people. What I want so bad for you and what I want for me is I want to be more like the first group of people. And I want us to say in this next year, how are we going to make sure that we finish this year? Because it might get worse. We don't know what it's going to be like. And so we want to be the kind of people that come out of this year closer to Jesus, more like Jesus, more inner personal strength, more of his love, his joy, his peace, his wisdom. And so that's my heart for you in this series. And so we're looking at some of the lessons we've learned last year, and we're talking about how, what are the values we have as a church and what have we learned that can help us be those people. 
And so the, one of the lessons we learned this last year is online church is good, but it's not a long-term substitute for in-person church. Now, we love our online service, and if you're watching online, we're so excited to have you with us worshiping together. But our ultimate goal is not that we would just create an online church. Our ultimate goal is it would bring people together in person into the church. And we have invested a lot of money and energy and time to create a digital ministry because we know that reaching people, not just on Sundays or in our growth groups or maybe in a discipleship one-on-one meeting, that's awesome. But there's even more opportunity for us to touch people's lives and help them where they are every day. And so we have done this. And I know some of you who are watching right now, you just can't be here. And so we understand you've, you're taking care of somebody who's high risk or you're high risk. We understand that and our hearts go out to you. We love you. We can't wait for you to come back. But we do hope someday to have you come back and maybe Easter would be a good time for that. But we, we want you to know and one of the things we learned is that God is present in a unique way when we gather together. There's something different. When I was a student and we would go up to this, this, uh, this sanctuary, the church, there was something unique and different about being in that place with those people that has set the atmosphere. And I don't know, this isn't like a theological statement, but God is, this is, God is everywhere we know, right? Scripture teaches that he's everywhere. But there's also times we know that we're more aware, like people say, man, God really showed up. I don't know, I guess that's accurate, but it's not totally accurate because I guess God was there before we thought he showed up. Maybe it's just that we're more aware of his presence. Or maybe he's there in a dynamic way. He manifests his presence to us and he's more real. And so we say, man, God was really there. Maybe it was like like when we were in that spot at the sanctuary, when I was growing up, we would worship. We just really felt God's presence in a deeper way, a thicker way, as ever people say. And we have a choice, don't we? We can come. And we can worship or we can worry. We can worship or we can critique. We can worship or we can plan our week. We can worship, right? There's things we we have a choice. And then we prayed and we didn't meet for 18 weeks, right? We said, we can't meet in person. And so we prayed and we prayed. What are we gonna do? What do we do? So we put the service online and then we met outside for 15 weeks. One of the things we learned is, man, People missed being together, together worshiping God. So when we were outside, people would say, man, I have missed this. And we've worked so hard to be safe when we're outside. We've worked so hard to be safe when we're inside. And it's not that we're insensitive or we're, or we're denying that there is a problem or that there's, there's a, a pandemic. We're not acting like there's not a risk. But what we're saying is we're gonna meet because it matters. Because there's a greater risk for us than COVID-19. And that is to leave the world without hope. That is that we would not be the church anymore. And as bad as this pandemic is, there's something worse. And that is living without hope. Because sometimes, you know, we think about physical death, but we don't think about spiritual death. In my neighborhood, there's been a a man who just took his life. And and you guys have probably seen all the statistics, or maybe there's not a lot of statistics right now, but you can find them on people that are ending their life. And so we made a decision that we're going to come together. And I don't want to judge other churches, and I don't want to judge, because every pastor, every church agonized over this decision. Every church, we need to believe that they did what God was leading them to do and trust them. But we believe we can meet safely, and so far we've been able to do that. We've worked really hard at that. But I've said this over and over to you guys. Jesus gathers his people together, pours his spirit through them. That's what he does. And so we've looked at a test every week, haven't we? There's been a test we've looked at, and the test I want to share with you today, if we're going to be people who have this 2021 be a year of growth and maturity and more of God's spirit in our life, then we're going to be people who pass this test. And the test is the test of presence. The test of presence. God's presence in me. God's presence in us. This is the test I want to talk to you about this morning. This is the test that we have to pass. And we have a value at our church about worship. And we have a statement we use. We say this, we say, we set the atmosphere. Because it's about worship. We want to create an environment where people can encounter 
the reality of God. We want to do everything we can so when people come to church together, when we gather together as Jesus' people around his truth and his way, that they would encounter the reality of God and that the Spirit of God in us and the Spirit of God who, who, who comes through us to minister to the people would make an impact on people's lives. We want to create an environment where people encounter the reality of God. And so we say, we set the atmosphere. And this is an important thing. I'm sure you've heard me say it many times before. When I was growing up, the youth leaders and the people and the people that designed the church, and they had done things to set the atmosphere. The architecture of the church was beautiful. And in those days, and, and some churches today, they still think about the, the the room and will it help you worship with architecture? Will it help you think about God? They turned the lights down. They had the, the cross thing going. They, had, they developed a, an expectation in our hearts for doing something deeper, more meaningful upstairs than just running around and having fun. And we loved it. And today I want to take a look at a group of people who were given this test of presence and see how they did with it so we can learn from them. And we're going to look at Exodus, and we're going to look at this time in history when God had freed his people from slavery. Maybe you, if you've read the Bible, you know Abraham. God made a covenant with Abraham and said, I'm going to bless you, and I'm going to give you all this land, which later became the promised land. They called the promised land. I'm going to give you all this land to you and your descendants, and I'm going to bless through you. I'm going to bless the world, and he did through Jesus. But then you, maybe you know there was a famine, and, and many of them had to go. This is generations later, had to go to Egypt. And there God used that as a way to, to prosper them so they could become a large nation of people. But then the Egyptians forgot about Joseph, if you've not scripture, and they started enslaving the Hebrew people. And it was incredibly difficult slavery. I mean, what slavery is not? And they were in bondage. And God sent Moses, he heard their cry, and he sent Moses to deliver them. And God did deliver them through all kinds of miraculous things, miracles. And he delivered them, and they were free. And they got free of the Egyptians, and they're excited. They're on the way to the promised land. And then Moses goes, okay, I'm gonna, guys, I'm going to go up here and hang out with God and get the Ten Commandments. He didn't say that to him, but I'm going to go. And he goes up for 40 days. He's with God hanging out, and he gets all the stuff from God, what God wants to do, how God wants the people to live their lives a certain way and understand how they can have a covenant with him. He comes back down. And when he comes down from the mountain, he sees all the people worshiping a golden calf. And he takes the Ten Commandments and he throws them down. And of course, God's upset. God even says, go, go down now and look at your people, what they're doing. And so we're going to pick this story up a little bit later. God's, they, they, they've gotten all that done and they've, they, they, were, they were trying to, the people were trying to take, combine the worship of God who delivered them Yahweh with the gods of Egypt and the way they worshiped in Egypt. And God was so discouraged. We're going to pick this story up now in Ephesians, excuse me, Exodus 33, verse 1. And God's talking to you about moving forward now. It's going to be one of those days, huh? The Lord said to Moses, get going, you and the people you brought from the land of Egypt. Get up to the land I swore to give to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Three generations, we think three. I told him, I will give this land to your descendants and I will send an angel before you to drive out the Canaanites, Amorites, Hittites, Pesrites, Raider fans, etc. Go up to this land that flows with milk and honey. This is a good land. I promise it to you. Go to it. I'm gonna give it to you. I keep my promise. It's time to go, Moses. Take the people. But he says this, but I will not travel among you, for you are a stubborn and rebellious people. I just delivered you guys all these miracles, all this stuff. You guys are so excited. And then you went and worshiped another God, trying to mix all this, worshiping me with these other gods. You went back to the way of Egypt. And he says this, <laughs> you are a stubborn and rebellious people. If I did, if I went with you guys, I would sure destroy you along the way. I'd wipe you guys out. You were it's your dad saying, I brought you in this world, son. I can, you know, take you out. Maybe that's, what, maybe, that's, maybe that's God's form of that. I don't know. Now, here's an amazing thing. Here's an amazing thing. I think a lot of us, given that option, are okay to go ahead with the angel. 
I think that's probably what's wrong with the American church. I mean, me, all of us, is that too often in our lives, we've been okay with getting the promises of God without the awareness of his presence in our life and us as a church. We've been okay with having the promises of God. We have a nice life. Because listen, God's ways work. See, what I want to say is if you're going to pass the test of promise, the presence rather, you, you can't settle for God's promises without his presence. And I think we've done that. Because like I said, God's ways work. God's way, ways, ways work in marriage. God's, way, we're, oh, God's ways work in business, in relationships. Look, one of the reasons, look at the, look at the Jewish people through the, throughout the history. They succeed. They do well. Why? Because God's ways work. They just do. And there's such blessing in it. You don't have to be a Christian to do things God's way and get blessed. But I think sometimes what happens is we're content for the blessings of the promise without the presence of God in our life. Personally, but also, I mean, God, if you're born again, God lives in you. I'm not saying that's not happening. The presence of God's there, and we'll look at that in a second. But as a church, we've been okay to go forward and like our church is good, our family's doing good, my business is good, my marriage is good, it's good, and we're okay to go to church and not feel the presence and the power of God. But if we're gonna pass the test I, in the future, it's not gonna be okay to have a nice church anymore. I don't wanna go back to where we were. We had a good church. Let's keep reading in the story. Well, then the people find out that God's upset with them this way and doesn't want to go with them. They mourn and they, they stop wearing jewelry. And then, then we're skipping three verses now to verse seven. It was Moses' practice to take, it was his practice to take the tent of meeting. The tent of meeting, yes, that's what that word tabernacle, if you've read Old Testament, tabernacle literally means tent of meeting. This became the temple. This is where he, God would meet with us and meet with, but here he's just meet with Moses. It was Moses' practice to take the tent of meeting, the first one, and set it up some distances from the camp. So this is, everyone who wanted to make a request to the Lord would go to the tent of meeting outside the camp. Whenever Moses went out to the tent of meeting, all the people would go, get up and stand at the entrance of their own tents. They would all watch Moses until he disappeared inside. And he went into the tent. And when he went to the tent, the pillar of the cloud would come down. That was the, God's presence was a pillar of cloud by day, right? He would, he would uh, and hover its entrance, hover at its entrance while the Lord spoke with Moses. When the people saw the cloud standing at the entrance of the tent, they would stand and bow down in front of their own tents. And inside the tent of meeting, the Lord would speak to Moses face to face as one speaks to a friend. And afterwards, Moses would return to the camp, but a young man assisted him, Joshua, the son of Nun, one of the only people in the Bible that doesn't have parents, would remain behind in the tent of meetings. It was Moses' practice to set up the tent of meeting. I could preach all day. I could, I could lecture myself all day about setting up the tent of presence, about making that practice of, of making room for God, of seeking his presence. I'm disappointed how often I give up the opportunity in my own devotional time to just not wait on the Lord and just keep moving and read and pray and then just keep going. But if you're going to make it in this next year, as someone who comes out more in love of Jesus, more hope, more joy, more love, you're going to be a person, you're going to understand that you are the tent of meeting. It's just what's amazing about what, what Jesus did. See, in the Old Testament, God would speak to people. He would come upon them. The Holy Spirit would come upon them. But in the, in the New Testament, he can live in all of us. God's, this has always been God's desire. He said, I'm going to take your heart of stone and I'm going to give you a heart of flesh and I'm going to dwell in you. And you're going to love me and I'm going to love you back. This is what it says in the Old Testament. It's not just the priest or the prophet or the king who the Holy Spirit comes upon and we hear this amazing stuff. Everyone who has faith in Christ has the Holy Spirit because you can't, you can't come to Christ without the Holy Spirit. You are the tent of meeting. 
I'm not talking about some new age idea like I am God or the God in me. I'm talking about the God of scripture, the Holy Spirit indwelling in you, a personal God. Look at Paul says to remind the people, he says, and do you not know that you are a temple of God and the spirit of God dwells in you? Do you not know you are the temple? What was before the temple? The tabernacle, what was before the tabernacle? The tent of meeting, the tent of meeting is a tabernacle. The temple is a place to meet God. And guess what you are? You are the temple. You are the temple. And the spirit of God dwells in you. But not just you individually. Paul also said that we together are those living stones that come together and make this temple, this household of God. It's not just me having the presence. It's we have his presence. Now, why why is it that we don't often feel the indwelling presence of God more? Have you asked yourself that question? Why, if it's true, and I've felt God's spirit in my life at times, but why don't I feel him very often? Well, the first answer is the world's broken. That's why Jesus came. And someday there's gonna be a time where there's not gonna be any separation, distraction, temptation, frustration, misunderstanding, dullness in our hearts. And we'll be able to experience the reality of God and the presence of God completely. And truthfully, uh, sometimes we do things to grieve the Holy Spirit's work in our lives. And so we numb his presence in our life. We do things. You know this is true. If you do something you know is wrong, you just feel distance from God. He still loves you. He'll forgive you. But just feel that distance, don't you? We've numbed ourselves. It's like we told the Holy Spirit, get out of, get out of the way. I got stuff I want to go and want you around. That's grieving the Holy Spirit. And there's so many distractions. But look what it says in Ephesians 1. Verse 13, in him you also, after listening to the message of the truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, were sealed with him, with the Holy Spirit of promise. When you came to faith in Christ, the Holy Spirit came into your life because you cannot receive Christ without the Holy Spirit. You can't understand it. And you have, he says, you have the Holy Spirit. Listen to what it says. It says, it's a seal with a promise of the Holy Spirit. Excuse me, me, I gotta read that right. Having also believed, you were sealed in him, with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is given, <laughs> who is given as a pledge of our inheritance, a down payment. The Holy Spirit's given to you as a pledge, as a down payment. Other translations use the word <laughs> pledge, down payment. Woohoo, come on. Youth ministry broke that, I guarantee it. It's worth it, though. All right. It's a price you pay, and it's worth it. Okay. God scared me. (sighs) So you have a down payment, a pledge, a guarantee of the future with a view to the redemption of God's own possession. That's us. To the praise of his glory. This future reality invades our lives by the Spirit of God. This future age that we're going to step into, we can taste His presence now, but someday there'll be no distractions, nothing holding us back. Ephesians 5, 18 says this, And do not get drunk with wine or weed or any other drug. Don't get drunk. That's not what I want to talk about. But I want to say is, for this is, oops, for this is dissipation. Yeah, you want, to, you want to go to weed for comfort and, and, and feel, it's going to dissipate you. You want to use alcohol, it's going to dissipate you. But here's what I want to emphasize. But be filled with the Spirit. Be filled with the Spirit. God's intention for you and I is that we be filled. Does, I have, when I come to faith in Christ, I have the Holy Spirit in my life. Can't come to faith in Christ. Can't happen without that. Have to have that. I got the Holy Spirit. But there are times that God wants to fill you even more and more and more all the time. Look, at, look through the witness of Acts. We don't have time to get there. We went through that whole series together over and over again. These guys who were apostles were then filled again with the Holy Spirit. We should all be open and seeking the presence and more of God's presence in our life through the Holy Spirit. So be filled with the Holy Spirit. Are you willing? Are you open? If you're going to make it, in this year, you got to be open to the Holy Spirit's work in your life. I guarantee you, there's more of God than you're experiencing right now. 
There's more of his presence than you're experiencing. There's more of awareness of his presence. There's more of what he wants to do in you, through you, and to you with his Holy Spirit. Let's keep reading. One day, Moses said to the Lord, you have been telling me, take these people up to the promised land, but you haven't told me whom you will send with me. You have told me, I know your name, and I look favorably upon you. If it is true that you look favorably on me, let me know your ways. So I may understand you more fully and continue to enjoy your favor. And remember, this nation is your very own people. Don't forget, God, it's not just me. These are your people. These are the ones you love. And the Lord replied, I will personally go with you, Moses, and I will give you rest. Everything will be fine for you. Then Moses said this, if you don't personally go with us, don't make us leave this place. Now, I want to tell you something powerful and important, and this is probably the center of the whole message. If you're going to make it as a person we've talked about, full of God in 2021, at the end of this year, no matter how hard it's been, if you're going to make it a person who's got the presence of God, that endurance, that depth, and maturity, it's gonna be, you're going to be a person who's unwilling to go forward without God's presence. Now, I, I get it. We all have his presence with us, but I mean an awareness of his presence, a, a, a seeking his presence. And I want to say that to, a, to you another thing. I, I want you to understand something. I want to go back and look at these verses again. Then the Lord replied, I will personally go with you, Moses, and I will give you rest. Everything you, everything will be fine with you. Now, I get it at a certain level. Each of us has a responsibility before God to love him and serve him, and he will bless us accordingly. It doesn't mean he's gonna make us rich or something. He might, but he will bless us because he's so good, and his ways works. And when when we seek him, we get his presence. He's the treasure. He's your source. But I want you to understand something so important. The whole point of this message this morning He says, Moses, I'm gonna go with you. It's gonna be good with you. But then he says, then Moses said, if you don't personally go with us. See, Moses wasn't okay to go ahead with God and him alone and leave the people behind. Do you understand? He said, if you don't personally go with us, don't make us leave this place. He says, Moses, I'll go with you. I'll make sure you're blessed. You'll have my presence. You'll be blessed, but I'm not going with this crowd. And Moses goes, wait, time out. If you don't go with us, don't make us leave. I don't want to go without. The, I don't want to go without your people. You love them, God, and I love them. And I don't want to go forward without them. If we're gonna make it, we get a passage test. You gotta understand God's presence isn't just for me. It isn't just for you. It's for us. It's for us. Jesus said, "This is why we talk about setting the atmosphere. This is why it matters. We come together as a church." and we experience the reality of God in this place. Jesus said this quickly, teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you and be sure of this, I am with you. He didn't just say, I am with you. He said, I'm with y'all. I'm with y'all. Even at the end of the age, yes, we have a personal presence of Christ in our life, but together, he does something unique and amazing. This Moses says to him, well, how, how will anyone know that you look favorably on me, on me and your people? If you don't go with us, you know what's wrong with our churches? Us. We've been willing to go forward without the presence of God. And people can walk into our churches and walk out and not think anything's different about us. Oh, they try to act good. Oh, other groups try to act good. Other groups have written laws and things that they're supposed to do. He says, if you don't go with us for your presence among us is what sets your people and me apart from all the other people of the earth. What is it that sets us apart? If we're gonna make it together as a church, 
and we're going to impact the culture and impact the city if we're going to be faithful in our generation. Look, we can't change everything all at once, and God isn't asking us to. He's saying, will you be faithful in this generation as my people? Like all the other people who were faithful, will you do that? They did in their generation, in their circumstances, in their marriage, in their neighborhood, in their city. Will you do that in your marriage, in your city, in your neighborhood, in your friends, in your school? Will you be faithful to me in your generation? Because if we're gonna be those people, we have to understand it's God's presence that sets us apart. And we cannot be willing to go forward personally without all of us coming together and experiencing the manifest presence of God. So people will come into this place and they would know something's different. We're not just good people because we obey his rules. And guess what? God's ways work, they do. But there's, some, there's a grace there's a love, there's a power, there's a glory here that's not from us. And by the way, <laughs> his presence sets us apart. It's an act of his grace. It's not like we earned it, did we? When people come to church and, 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 and they don't know the Lord, but the people that love the Lord there have set the atmosphere. They know something's different. I remember I have some friends. One of them's still a good friend of mine. Years ago, they came to church and they were living together in a homosexual relationship and they came into the church and they felt the presence of God so strong. It wasn't this church. I wish I could say it was, but it wasn't. They felt the presence of God so strong. One of them had to leave and the other one went to the front and just repented. Because the power and the presence and the glory of God was there. It, we, I, church cannot be boring if God is there. God is not boring. And the times in your life when God is moving and the adventure of God in your life or the times you felt his presence, it is not boring. When I was a junior high kid, I'd go up to this place on top of the church and we'd pray and we'd worship and I loved it and it was awesome and it was not boring. It'll never be boring. People will be healed people will change their lives. And this is my challenge to you as a church and to us together, is that we cannot go forward without his presence. We must set the atmosphere. We must be hungry for it. We must wait for it. We must seek it for his presence. We must cooperate with it. We must prepare for it. This is why I say we have to set the atmosphere. Every Sunday, you know, I drive in my car, and since the start of this church, I made a deal that I, this is still stupid. It's not stupid, but I would drive down there with no music, nothing, because I just wanted to be in God's presence. I, I often will pray, and I'll speak in tongues, and I'll ask for the presence of God to help me, help us. And when we have our rally together, I was telling the, the leaders, the uh, first service rally, talking about how important it is, we set the atmosphere. Can you imagine if you would do nothing but just be quiet and pray on the way to church every Sunday. By the time you got here, can you imagine how you'd be ready to worship God? When we encounter the presence of God, we can face and endure unbelievable suffering. When we're in presence of God, we can learn how to serve Him more powerfully and effectively. We can focus our hearts on Him. We can enjoy Him. Would you stand? We're gonna close the service with some worship. And I want to challenge you to set the atmosphere and I want to read this passage to you. This is the closing passage. The Lord replied to Moses, I will indeed do what you have asked for. This is what God said. For I look favorably on you and I know you by name. He says, I like what you're asking, Moses. I'm going to do it. Don't you think it pleases God when we say, God, we need more of your presence. Don't let us go forward without you. Not just for me, but for all of us. And then Moses responded, then show me your glorious presence. Show me your glory. What would it be like if you came to church on Sunday and you set the atmosphere on me? You came knowing you were here to give something. You didn't come empty handed. And I'm not just talking about an offering. I'm talking about your heart. A offering of your heart. You came to bring something to God. You knew that that was what you were supposed to do. And you prayed and you prepared your heart to do it. And you came humbly and you offered yourself. What would our church be like if we set the atmosphere like that? What would people experience? What if you said to God right now, close your eyes. What if you said to God, why don't you say it to God right now? God, I don't want to go forward without you in my life. 
I know I've chased other things and I, I know, but you are the treasure. You are the best thing. I don't wanna go forward, Lord, but also I, I don't wanna go forward without us together. I don't wanna leave anyone behind. Would you show me, show us your glory?